with you. This is the fourth Sunday after Holy Trinity. The order of service is Divine Service 3, uh, found on page 184. One note about the service. Ignore the double tone for the uh, intro it. I miscounted how many stanzas there were or verses there were for the intro it, and so it wouldn't work. Uh, so uh, whatever uh, Crystal chooses for a, a single psalm tone is what we're going to use. So listen to that instead of looking at the notes. So uh, we'll make it work so this morning. But uh, also, a note about the distribution uh, from now on as the steward of the mysteries to better um, <coughs> uh, practice close communion and to be able to uh, tend the table. Uh, I will be distributing the host as well as the chalice. Uh, but the deacon will be taking the individual cups in between. Uh, and so there will be a little bit of a leg, but not much. Um, uh, so if you want the chalice, wait. I will be bringing it through uh, after, uh, after the individual cups. So, uh, so keep that uh, in mind as we go forward. Uh, other than that, we begin with our opening hymn, 815. <coughs>
In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Beloved in the Lord, let us draw near with a true heart, and confess our sins unto God our Father, beseeching Him in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, to grant us forgiveness. Our help is in the name of the Lord. I said I will confess my transgressions unto the Lord. O Almighty God, merciful Father, I, a poor, miserable sinner, confess unto you all my sins and iniquities with which I have ever offended you and justly deserve your temporal and eternal punishment. But I am heartily sorry for them and sincerely repent of them. And I pray you of your boundless mercy and for the sake of the holy, innocent, bitter sufferings and death of your beloved Son, Jesus Christ, to be gracious and merciful to me, a poor sinful being. Upon this, your confession, I, by virtue of my office as a called and ordained servant to the Word, announce the grace of God unto all of you. And in the stead and by the command of my Lord Jesus Christ, I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The Lord is my light and my salvation, whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life, of whom shall I be afraid? When evildoers assail me to eat up my flesh, my adversaries and foes, it is they who stumble and fall. Though an army encamp against me, my heart shall not fear. Though war arise against me, yet I will be confident. One thing I ask of the Lord, that will I seek after. I dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life. For he will hide me in his shelter in the day of trouble. He will conceal me under the cover of his tent. He will lift me high upon a rock. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now and will be forever. Amen. The Lord is my light and my salvation, whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life, of whom shall I be afraid? When evildoers assail me to eat up my flesh, my adversaries and foes, it is they who stumble and fall. Lord, have mercy upon us. Christ, have mercy upon us. Lord, have mercy upon us. Glory be to God on high, and on earth peace, good will toward men. We praise Thee, we bless Thee, we worship Thee, we glorify Thee, we give thanks to Thee for Thy great glory. O Lord God, Heavenly King, God the Father, all 
Almighty, O Lord, the only begotten Son, Jesus Christ, O Lord God, Lamb of God, Son of the Father, that takest away the sin of the world, have mercy upon us. Thou that takest away the sin of the world, receive our prayer. Thou that sittest at the right hand of God the Father, have mercy upon us. For Thou only art holy, only art the Lord. Thou only, O Christ, with the Holy Ghost, art most high in the glory of God the Father. Amen. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. O Lord, grant that the course of this world may be so peaceably ordered by your governance that your church may joyfully serve you in all godly quietness. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God now and forever. The Old Testament for the fourth Sunday after Holy Trinity is written in the first book of Moses, commonly called Genesis, the 50th chapter. When Joseph's brothers saw that their father was dead, they said, It may be that Joseph will hate us and pay us back for all the evil that we did to him. So they sent a message to Joseph saying, your father gave this command before he died. Say to Joseph, please forgive the transgression of your brothers and their sin because they did evil to you. And now, please forgive the transgression of the servants of the God of our fa your father. Joseph wept when they spoke to him. His brothers came and fell down before him and said, Behold, we are your servants. But Joseph said to them, Do not fear, for am I in the place of God? As for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good, to bring it about that many people should be kept alive as they are today. So do not fear. I will provide for you and your little ones. Thus he comforted them and spoke kindly to them. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Atone for our sins, for your name's sake. Why should the nation say, where is their God? Help us, O God of our salvation, for the glory of your name deliver us. The epistle is written in St. Paul's, uh, Paul's letter to the church in Rome, the eighth chapter. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. For the creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope that the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to decay and obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth 
until now. And not only the creation, but we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, grown inwardly as we wait eagerly for adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. We stand for prayer. Alleluia. 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 The Holy Gospel according to St. Luke, the sixth chapter. Jesus said, Be merciful, even as your Father is merciful. Judge not, and you will not be judged. Condemn not, and you will not be condemned. Forgive, and you will be forgiven. Give, and it will be given to you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over, will be put into your lap. For with the measure you use, it will be measured back to you. Jesus also told them a parable. Can a blind man lead a blind man? Will they not both fall into a pit? A disciple is not above his teacher, but everyone, when he is fully trained, will be like his teacher. Why do you see the speck that is in your brother's eye, but do not notice the log that is in your own eye? How can you say to your brother, Brother, Let me take out the speck that is in your eye when you yourself do not see the log that is in your own eye. You hypocrite. First, take the log out of your own eye and then you will see clearly to take out the speck that is in your brother's eye. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise be to thee, O Confess our faith in the words of the Nicene Creed. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten, not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary and was made man, and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried, and the third day he rose again according to the Scriptures and ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of the Father, And he will come again with glory to judge both the living and the dead, whose kingdom will have no end. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets. And I believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, And I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen.
In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. A bad conscience, when left untreated, will fester and waste away one's body and soul. It will never remain benign. It will always boil to the surface and pardon the graphic image. Like a festering boil or a zit, it will explode and ooze out onto everyone around you. Case in point, Joseph's brothers at the passing of their father, Jacob. What exactly is a bad conscience? To start an answer to that question, first, what is a conscience? One's conscience is first and foremost a gift of God, given to all men. It is the inner voice that judges what is right or wrong. It is the referee that accuses or excuses us, our neighbor, and the world around us. It is given to us as a tool to judge our own thoughts, words, and deeds, and it is also given to judge the thoughts, words, and deeds of others. And finally, it is given to judge that things in this world ain't right. What then makes a conscience good or bad? At creation, our conscience was only good because there was nothing bad. There was no sin in the creation. Everything about it, or everything about us, was very good, right, and salutary. Our wills were one with God, and we perfectly believed His word that we and every creature, everything in creation, was very good. Now that all changed when Adam and Eve ate of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. At that moment, the conscience was completely broken. It no longer judged everything good according to God's declaration, according to His Word, including the prohibition of not eating the forbidden fruit. Instead of believing the Word of God, our first parents entertained a different word, a lie. A lie which in turn corrupted their consciences permanently. Their inner voice reasoned. It excused their actions. The lie, the word not of God, also after the fact, instructed them to act in unbelief and terror. Because they were no longer good, by a perverse twist, everything, including God, was now no longer good. A bad conscience can be compared to a dirty window of a house. You are the house. And because the window, your window is dirty, nothing looks right. Try as you might to convince yourself that you are clean on the inside when the light from outside shines through the, your dirty window, everything looks dreadfully filthy. When you, see, when you try to look through the window to the outside world, the dirty window shows everything to be dirty there, too. As you stare through your dirty window and you try desperately to clean it, you end up adding dirt to the window and in fact turning that dirt into a polished surface, a mirror, which stares back at you your own reflection. So a bad conscience leaves you miserable about everything. Nothing is left that is not tainted by it. How you feel about yourself, how you perceive everything and everyone around you, and how you see yourself in, reflect, in, in, in relation to everything and everyone around you is corrupted. So a bad conscience plays itself out when you see, when your sin is left unresolved, unforgiven. Your brokenness is ever before you. A silly example of this is when you have sinned and you know what you did is not pleasing to God according to the Ten Commandments, but you carry on as if nothing is wrong. Then on your way to work, you hit every single red light and then there's an accident on the freeway and then you spill your coffee on your lap. And then the first thought in your mind is that God is punishing you for your sin. Another more serious manifestation of a bad conscience is when some genuinely 
someone genuinely seeks to offer help to you, seeking, seeing that you are struggling in one way or another, and instead of receiving it in thanksgiving, you snap in anger at the love of the giver. Why? Because your bad conscience, your sin, obscures reality. Your sin troubles you so that you would rather shut your eyes to it, to the good. But when you receive something good by another, all you can see and think about is yourself and your sin. I don't deserve this. If only they knew what I've done. What if they, what if they knew? What if they already know? What if they know that, and that's why they're helping? They can't be trusted. Just wait. The, own, the other shoe will fall and they will not be so nice then. They're just doing this to use me later. In all of this, a bad conscience sees only one thing. The self. Everything is judged in full view of the one reflected in the dirty mirror of a bad conscience. Because the self is sinful, all that is seen good or bad, is sinful too. Everything terrorizes the soul. Every bump in the dark triggers one's fight or flight response. Everything becomes about self-preservation. It leads to hiding, to self-medicating, to self-promotion, to self-justification. It leads to lying, lying to others and lying to ourselves. Nothing is real. Nothing is real with a bad conscience. Jacob's sons did a wicked thing to their little brother Joseph. Jealousy and envy don't even begin to convey how they loathed him. They hated him. Most of them wanted him dead, and they would have gotten their way if it were not for Reuben. And ironically, it was Judah who suggested that they sell Joseph to the Ishmaelites for 20 pieces of silver. They all then took the robe of, color, of many colors, dipped it in goat's blood, and, and gave it to their dad and let him think his son was dead, having been torn to pieces and devoured by a fierce animal. Maybe say, a lion. This hatred betrayal, and lie would fester for decades, for about 20 years. When they first came to Egypt during the seven years of famine, they had no clue that Joseph had ended up in Egypt. They also could not have imagined that their brother would have risen to, the, to second in command in Egypt. So God, through Joseph and his dreams, did prophesy that the brothers would one day bow down to their little brother. Because they were blind and deaf to the word of God, they could not recognize Joseph. When things be begin to fall apart and getting, uh, and getting provisions was proving difficult, terror of conscience sets in. In Hebrew, not knowing that Joseph could understand them, they question each other and posit that it is all because of what they had done to their brother those many years ago. Their conscience is festered within them. Their bad consciences don't stop there, though. After being sent home with a command not to return without Jacob's next favorite son, Benjamin, the second born of Rachel, when they got home, they found that their bags were, had plenty of provisions, but also that the money that they had paid for this provision was put back in the bags with them. They were petrified by such findings. They knew they didn't deserve it. And so they waited. They waited as long as possible to share with Jacob the conditions of their return to Egypt for more food. Reluctantly, Jacob allows Benjamin to go. But, when it hits, but then it hits the fan. Joseph, as a feast for them, gives Benjamin twice as much as the others. 
And this perplexes them. They're on pins and needles the whole time. And then Joseph commands that the sacred vessels be planted in Benjamin's things, in his bag. And then he sends them off, sends them back home. But after they departed, Joseph sends troops to find his things. And under that pretense, arrests Benjamin. And it is too much to hear, too much to bear for the brothers. And so they return to Joseph and plead for their brother's life and confess what they had previously done to Joseph and how it all, it's all because of that, that all these things are happening. They finally said it in that moment. They confess the truth. We are liars. They lied to themselves. They lied to their father. They lied to Joseph. They lied to God. But now they have confessed the truth. The truth that we all need to confess. All men are liars. A bad conscience makes us this. It makes us all liars. It makes us incapable of telling the truth about ourselves, others. About ourselves, others, and God. The hope we have in such a state is to receive to receive what Joseph's brothers received. The declaration of God's holy word. The whole counsel of God. The law which convicts them and us of our sins and their suffering. Their suffering was the catalyst of the Holy Spirit working with the word in their given situation to bring them to the truth that they might speak it by his instructing. They couldn't perpetuate the lie anymore. Their bones wasted away within them. They needed to come clean and confess the truth. To this God, through Joseph, declared the truth as well. God forgives them. He forgave them. Joseph forgave them. Like a splash of the purest of waters, their windows were washed clean. Clean by God. At least they should have been. I say should have been, not because God didn't actually do it. He did. It's just that the brothers didn't receive it. At Jacob's death, it turns out they didn't really believe the forgiveness as they should have. They held on to their dirty windows, as it were. Sadly, as sinners, they had come, to a, to a, had come accustomed to their terror. It was a way of self-atonement, of paying back what they had done. They thought maybe God forgave gave them, but since they couldn't forgive themselves, then Joseph hasn't really forgiven them either. Such thinking is flawed because it means they didn't believe God's forgiveness was enough. They didn't trust Him. They didn't believe His Word. And so they fell back into the lies they were freed from by God and Joseph. They could not imagine God or Joseph being able to, to mean what they said because they had become so good at lying to themselves. They thought everyone else was the same. If everyone is a liar, then there is, then where is the comfort? Where is the comfort to be found in this world, in this life? It is possible to find relief from a guilty, bad conscience. But it's not in us. It is in the mercy of God. It is in Jesus, the way, the truth, and the life. And only in Him. It is in what He declares to us and what He makes us by His divine word of forgiveness. When we are brought to confess the truth, it is God's word working on us that is showing us what we truly are. We are sinners. 
We are sinners declared righteous for Jesus' sake. We are sinners, true, but we are made by Jesus forgiven saints. Our brothers, our brother, by his blood, hoses us down with, his, with holy water. We are baptized, forgiven all of our sins, and adopted into his family. We are made what we otherwise could never make ourselves. What he says to us and about us is divine. It is sure and certain because it is from God, not from men. The truth is that by Jesus' blood and righteousness given to us in our baptism, we are able to confess the truth that we are perfect saints. Which is to say then that we have a God who loves us, has mercy on us, and judges us innocent for Jesus' sake. Our consciences are cleaned. And with a clean conscience, we can see things as they truly are. Good is good, bad is bad. We are liars, yes, but we are forgiven. Forgiven all the more. We are saints. With a good conscience, we can now properly evaluate ourselves, our neighbors, and our God our Jesus, for what makes a good conscience is God's word of forgiveness as we live by His judgments, His word, in the vocations in which He has placed us. When we fail, the temptation to revert to our old ways of lying is strong, but for our good, in His mercy, we are placed into a family, into a church, it is here, in this place, the truth is proclaimed and declared to you and, and me. We are fortified. Fortified against the lie, the lies of the devil, the world, and our own sinful selves. We're given here the word of God. The better way, the truth and the life. We're given here Jesus, who makes us who we are. Trusting Him, trusting Him through thick and thin, confessing the truth according to His holy word, calling good, good, and evil, evil, that sets us free. That sets us free and makes us our, and our consciences good, cleaned and made good by Jesus. So don't fear your sin any longer. Confess them instead. Confess and be forgiven. Receive from Jesus His blood and His merciful judgment. Receive from Jesus merciful judgment and be set free. You who repent are forgiven. That is the measure He has for you. He gives you everything, you, uh, everything for your ultimate good. He doesn't hate you. He, does, he doesn't through you. He doesn't throw you into a pit or sell you into slavery to a foreign country. No, He redeems Judah. And instead of ripping you apart and destroying the family, He brings peace. The lion and the lamb as one. He is sold, not for 20, but 30 pieces of silver. He reconciles us all together. We are free free to see the logs in our own eyes and, and confess them, taking them and giving them to Jesus because it is He who carried them to, the, to Calvary and was crucified. They are not against us anymore. Jesus is not against us. The Father has had mercy on us. The only way they are held against us as if we would not let them go. That we would hold on to them and keep our consciences bad. In the Son of God, in Jesus, you are set free. And if the Son has set you free, you are free indeed. So speak the truth. Live in the truth the truth of God's Word. 
You have a good conscience by that word. And with that good conscience, you have peace and joy. Peace and joy that goes beyond all comprehension. Because it is in Jesus, your Lord. In His name, Amen. We stand for prayer. Now the peace of God that passes all understanding. Keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Amen. Create in me a clean heart, O God. We rise for prayer. In our prayers this morning, we continue to pray for Cheryl Krieger and David Rathke receiving treatment for cancer. We continue to pray for Donna Trubeck, Stacy's grandmother, who has just recently returned home from a brief hospital stay. And we pray for Tanya Kramer, uh, uh, niece-in-law to Sally May, uh, who is also undergoing cancer treatment. Let us pray. Let us pray for the whole church of God in Christ Jesus and for all people according to their needs. O Lord, our light and our salvation, you are our strength. Work in us a worthy fear and constant trust in your mercy that we would fear nothing else in this passing world. Lord, in your mercy. Gracious Lord, sustain, uh, sustain Matthew Harrison, our Synod President, Eric Scovegard, our district president, Joseph Fisher, our circuit visitor, and our pastor, as they proclaim your exalted name and word to us, that we may give thanks to your, uh, thanks to your name for your steadfast love and faithfulness toward us in Christ, our, Christ Jesus. Lord, in your mercy. Father, enable us through your law to see the logs in our own eyes, not only the specks in our brothers, that we may not be judged and condemned by our own judgment and condemnation. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. Almighty Lord, you raised up Joseph according to your plan to exercise authority in Egypt, working good from what was meant only for evil. 
work by your power in the leaders and authorities of our nation, whom you have set in place, that many would be kept alive and protected in this life through their governance. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. Bless the schools of the church and all church and, co and all colleges, universities, and centers of research, and those who teach and work in them, especially St. John's as, as we seek to open Lutheran Classical Academy in the fall of 2025. Grant your wisdom in such measure that people may serve you honorably in church and state, and that our common life may be conformed to the ways of your truth. Lord, in your mercy. Lord God, answer Cheryl Krieger, David Rathke, Donna Trubach, Tanya Kramer, and all who suffer in our midst on the day when, when they call to you by increasing their, their strength of soul. Preserve their lives and grant them health and healing in accord with your perfect will. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. Heavenly Father, though we walk in the midst of trouble, in this broken world. You preserve our lives in your Son, who forgives and sustains us with his body and blood. Stretch out your hand against sin, death, and hell to deliver us from their wrath. Lord, in your mercy. Lord God, Heavenly Father, you are merciful and through, Jesus, and through Christ have promised that you will neither judge nor condemn us, but graciously forgive all our sins and abundantly provide for all our wants of body and soul. By your Holy Spirit, establish in our hearts a confident faith in your mercy. Teach us, in turn, to be merciful to our neighbor, that we may not judge or condemn others, but willingly forgive all and judge ourselves, only ourselves. Lead blessed lives in your, fe in your fear through the same Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The Lord be with you. Lift up your heart. Let us give thanks unto the Lord our God. It is meet and right so to do. It is truly good, meet, right, and salutary that we should at all times and in all places give thanks to you, Holy Lord, Almighty Father, everlasting God, through Jesus Christ our Lord who out of love for his fallen creation humbled himself by taking on the form of a servant, becoming obedient unto death, even death upon a cross. Risen from the dead, he has freed us from eternal death and given us life everlasting. Therefore with angels and archangels, and with all the company of heaven, we laud and magnify your glorious name, evermore praising you and saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. 
Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is given for you. This do in remembrance of me. In the same way also, he took the cup after supper, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you. This cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. This do as often as you drink it, in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Christ shed for you. The blood of Christ is shed for you. 
blood of Christ sheds for you. The blood of Christ sheds for you. The blood of Christ shed 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 for you. Now the true body and blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ strengthen and preserve you in the one true faith throughout this life and the life to come. Through God and God's peace, your sins are forgiven.
shed through the blood of Christ. Shed for you. Now the true body and blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ strengthen and preserve you with the one true faith throughout this life and the life to come. We find you God's peace for our sins and our forgiveness.
Oh, give thanks unto the Lord, for He is good. Let us pray. We give thanks to you, Almighty God, that you have refreshed us through this salutary gift. And we implore you that of your mercy you would strengthen us through the same, in faith toward you and in fervent love toward one another. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God now and forever. The Lord be with you. And with thy spirit. Bless we the Lord. And the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and to be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Trust your days and burdens to God's most loving hand. He cares for you while ruling the sky, the sea, the land. For He who guides the tempest along the thunderous ways will find for you a pathway and guide you all your days. Rely on God your Savior and find your life secure. Make His work your foundation that your work may endure. No anxious thought, no worry, no self-tormenting care can win your Father's favor. His heart is moved by prayer. Take heart, have hope, my spirit, and do not be dismayed. God helps in every trial and makes you unafraid. Await his time with patience through darkest hours of night. Until the sun you hoped for delights your eager sight. Leave all to his direction, his wisdom rules for you. In ways to rouse your wonder at all his love can do. Soon he is promised keeping will wonder working past will banish him your spirit what gave you troubled hours O oh, blessed air of heaven You'll hear the song resound. Hope 
endless jubilation when you with life are crowned. In your right hand your Maker will place the victor's palm, and you will thank Him gladly with heaven's joy. Our hands and feet, Lord, strengthen with joy our spirits bless until we see the ending of all our life's distress. And so throughout our lifetime, keep us within your care. And at our end, when bring us to heaven to praise you there. You may be seated. The Lord, blessings to you again this fourth Sunday after Holy Trinity. Uh, there are a couple of announcements this morning. Do I want to make them or, do, or am I making them? All right, Tim, you first. All right, sounds good. All right, um, when, uh, tomorrow night we continue to gather for uh, confession study and uh, gemilukite uh, beforehand. Uh, we are still going through the Augsburg Confession. I want to make sure I get through that document before we move on. So uh, ignore the schedule that's on the flyer. We're still doing it though. Uh, and we've had a good turnout, a good discussion. Uh, we'll keep moving on uh, into, um, I think we're at 14, or no, 11 or 12. I can't remember which article we're on. But yes, Chuck. Yeah, Chuck. And that's July 12th, right? Yes, Friday night. At, what time does it start? Five o'clock. Five and then um, six o'clock in the morning, Nick? <laughs> or, no, no, okay, all right, all right, no, no, five. So yeah, we'll start at five. <laughs> yes, yes. So uh, at the Yacht Club here in Port? Yes. Okay. All right, so keep that in mind. I put that on your calendar. We dearly miss uh, uh, Darlene and. Uh, we know that she was here this morning, gathered around the body and blood of Jesus on the other side of paradise, and we wait for the resurrection on the last day to meet her again. Um, are there any other announcements at this time? Seeing none, may God keep you safe from the palm of his hands until we meet again. God bless.